So hi everyone, welcome to the first Eurographics 2020 education track that uh, focus on how we can improve uh, the way we design and teach uh, computer graphics courses. So first of all, let me introduce myself. I'm Andreas Vasilakis, I'm from Athens University of Economics and Business, and I will be the chair for this uh, session. Uh, the session contains uh, three papers, diverse, but uh, very interesting in their own way. Uh, first of all, we have the uh, Rayground, an online education tool for ray tracing, uh, which are from uh, Nick Vitas, Anastasius Garavellis, Andreas Vasilakis, Konstantinos Vardis, and uh, Georges Papayoanou, all from the Athens University of Economics and Business. Second uh, is the designing a course on non photorealistic rendering from Ivailo in Linking from uh, uh, Gettingburg College from USA. And uh, last but not least, critical thinking sheet for design thinking in programming courses from uh, Jonathan Roberts and Panos Richos from Bangor University. Uh, so uh, please post any questions you have for the presenters over YouTube and Discord channel. And then I will read them out to the presenters in order to answer them live of course, time permitting. So let's move to the action and let's see what a ray ground really is. Hi, my name is Nick Vitas. I'm a PhD student from the Computer Graphics Group of Athens University of Economics and Business. This is a presentation of our work on Rayground, an online educational tool for ray tracing. Ray tracing is one of the most common teaching subjects in computer graphics courses, presented as an elegant and robust algorithm for image synthesis. Undergraduate graphics syllabi are built around the rasterization pipeline and devote a limited number of lectures to explain the basic concepts of ray tracing. Inevitably, this paradigm shift requires a lot of rewiring. Graduate syllabi need to cover a wide range of advanced and diverse topics and don't have much time to introduce the basics. Both students and instructors struggle to make the quick transition from rasterization to ray tracing. After all, rasterization and ray tracing are very different in terms of mechanics but at a high level share a large portion of computer graphics theory. Recent advances indicate that ray tracing based methods can be further adopted and integrated into computer graphics courses at all levels. Unfortunately, this trend is not backed by widely available educational tools that improve the learning curve and support the newfound popularity of ray tracing. Recently, there has been a rise in learning material related to ray tracing. Two successful examples are Peter Sillery's Ray tracing in one weekend series, which introduces the basics with a mentality of getting you to a cool program as quickly as possible. Then, for a full journey from theory to implementation, physically based rendering of the book has been a staple in recent years and has recently been made available online. However, such solutions lack interactivity and do not provide easy prototyping capabilities. The improvements in hardware are also backed by software solutions, with ray tracing rapidly being introduced in modern graphics APIs. The question is whether these APIs are ready to support computer graphics courses. They are very low level and complex APIs. This is understandable as they have to squeeze every last bit of performance out of the hardware while remaining flexible and configurable. They are therefore not suitable for introductory courses. Also, implementation maturity varies across devices and especially state-of-the-art ray tracing features are not widely supported. More often than not, these APIs or frameworks are heavily dependent on very specific software and hardware. Not to mention that all this flexibility and performance comes at the cost of long and complex installation instructions where you need to potentially support multiple API versions and maintain a large dependency tree. A CPU framework could be developed, but it would be very slow on commodity hardware and would require significant effort to remain cross-platform. 
And just as we thought that we were running out of options, we considered the World Wide Web. It is by far the platform with the biggest outreach, so it is a great choice for the deployment of educational tools. The sandbox environment in modern browser is perfect for a consistent and secure platform that automatically gets updated. It is grounded on a series of international open standards with wide adoption and has had access to GPU computations through the WebGL1 and WebGL2 standards. Of course, not everything is perfect. Ray tracing is a computationally demanding task. There is no functionality exposed in any modern web standard that can accommodate ray tracing acceleration. Even the WebGL spec is very limited in terms of general purpose GPU computing. Also, having a sandbox environment that puts security, stability and cross-device support first means that you have to make sacrifices both in terms of flexibility and performance. We are definitely not the first to see this opportunity. There have been many successful examples of online interactive tools for computer graphics. Shader Toy is a widely popular platform for experimenting with fragment shaders and screen space effects that has also been used for ray tracing, albeit with procedural geometry and within a fragment shader. Babylon.js, a popular JavaScript graphics library, has a playground for rapid experimentation with graphics in an online IDE fashion. Examples like these motivated us to pursue a similar online tool specifically targeted to ray tracing. We set a series of goals and non-goals. We wanted a highly accessible platform that could run on a wide range of devices. We emphasized on the concept of rapid prototyping, quick to set up, easy to experiment. Use the tool to improve both lectures and lab courses, encourage gradual self-study. Ease of remote teaching was also a major concern. Ensure as smooth a transition as possible from rasterization to ray tracing. Demystify ray tracing fundamentals through a programmable graphics pipeline of distinct configurable ray tracing stages. We wanted a modern API that would be familiar to experienced users and easy to pick up for newcomers. Our non-goals were much simpler. We understood that we could not develop a tool that could completely replace modern rasterization-based APIs. We do not have the intention of offering a fully featured API for programming ray tracing algorithms. This would have definitely gotten in the way of simplicity and smooth transition. To a large extent, we achieved our goals and RayGround is a ray tracing prototyping tool on the web that is open, cross-platform and available to everyone. The platform is hosted on RayGround.com and works on any platform that has a WebGL2 compliant browser. Let's discuss the ray tracing pipeline that RayGround exposes. As mentioned before, we wanted our API to closely match the design of other modern ray tracing pipelines. Everything in computer graphics begins with the definition of a scene. Next is the phase of generating primary rays and submitting them for intersection with the scene. The next step depends on the results of the intersection. Rays that do not intersect the scene trigger a miss event and rays that hit part of the scene's geometry generate a hit event. Whether the ray triggers a miss or a hit event, a recursive step begins where new rays can be submitted for intersection. Commonly, this recursion breaks after a predetermined amount of steps called the recursion depth. After the recursion depth is read, or no rays are submitted, the pipeline switches to the accumulation stage. Here, the calculated result of the current pipeline execution, which most times it's simply the pixel's color, are blended with the results of previous pipeline executions. The accumulated values are submitted to a post-processing stage where final filtering is applied to the accumulation buffer and lastly, post-processed values are submitted as RGB color values to the frame buffer. The question that is raised naturally is which of these steps should be programmable. To maintain simplicity and in accordance with modern graphics APIs, we came up with the following programmable pipeline. One declarative state 
for scene specification and four programmable stages for supporting a wide range of ray tracing based algorithms. In this pipeline, user code is provided for each programmable stage and is called every time the relevant event is triggered. Since we are using WebGL, the programming language is a familiar GLSL language. We do not expose the internals of acceleration data structures to the ray ground developer for simplicity and future proof code design since the internals of the ray tracer are likely to change. Similarly, for the accumulation operation, which is fixed to additive alpha blending. So, we have the following configurable stages. Scene definition, where the user specifies object properties and global simulation settings. Ray generation stage for primary rays. Miss or hit stage, where intersection data become available and new rays are spawned into the scene. The post-processing stage, which completes the image synthesis for the current rendering frame. Here's a quick reference to the RayGround API. The specifics of each variable do not matter here, and we only want you to get a sense of how the API is structured. We wanted students to feel right at home. We wanted to map fundamental concepts of ray tracing to a GL-like API. For example, rays are submitted for intersection by assigning to the built-ins RG ray direction and RG ray origin. Also, during the hit stage, the user is expectedly given access to built-in variables that hold the normal, position, material ID, and other intersection-related values. The scene is described using a simple custom JSON format. The inputs required are simulation settings and object geometry. The most common simulation setting is that of the recursion depth we discussed earlier. As for objects, we made sure to add support for basic 3D shapes which are positioned in the scene using a transformation, rotation and scale triplet. Per object material properties are also supported and become available at the heat stage for use in local shading. During ray generation, the user submits a code snippet that executes in parallel for each pixel. Given the pixel's coordinates and canvas dimensions, one can generate rays from a virtual camera. For flexibility, each ray carries a user-assignable payload and accumulation value. A ray is submitted in code by setting the built-in variables RG ray origin and RG ray direction. Ray payload and accumulation are initialized through RG payload X and RG accumulation. It is easy to think of each ray as carrying a struct of the form showcased in the lower right corner of the slide. Submitted rays are consequently intersected with the scene and the framework triggers a miss or a hit event accordingly. This is where local shading commonly takes place. Visibility queries are also very useful in this stage and can be performed using the RG Trace Occlusion API function within the shader. Secondary rays are submitted in code, again by assigning to the built-in variables RG ray origin and RG ray direction. Ray payload and ray accumulation are further updated through RG payload X and RG accumulation. These newly submitted rays are in turn intersected with the scene, potentially triggering new miss or hit event. A pixel shader's execution only stops when the max depth iteration is reached or each ray is set to inactive. Here's a preview of some of the built-ins exposed through the API during hit events. These are the values after the first bounce event. They are useful for appearance shading and next event estimation. The miss event type does not expose any geometric properties but is used for background coloring. Finally, after the recursion depth has been reached and accumulation has taken place, the user gains random access to the accumulation buffer in the final post-processing state. All sorts of filters can be applied here, some relevant to ray tracing in particular and some relevant to computer graphics in general. Ray Ground's design had teaching at its core and for the time being, 
had to coexist with the rasterization-based teaching solution. Through rapid prototyping, high interactivity and familiarity offered by GLSL, it's a perfect fit for the introduction of ray tracing after spending time in courses in order to teach OpenGL and the standard graphics pipeline. We considered Rayground for interactive lectures, lab coursework, live examination, exercises, self-study and more. We designed coursework using Rayground for both undergraduate and graduate courses. For the undergraduate course structure, to facilitate the inclusion of a new tool alongside a standard rasterization-based framework, we abstracted the rendering pipeline. We divided it into four generic stages geometry setup, sampling or fragment generation, shading, and compositing, so that they could be independently mapped to rasterization or ray tracing accordingly. This allowed common topics to remain separate from the underlying pipeline. Topics such as material properties, local shading, geometry representation, texturing, image domain sampling, and aliasing etc. The actual lectures were enriched with interactive demonstrations of ray tracing concepts using Rayground. Implementation and theory could now walk hand in hand. This prompted more students to actively participate and helped them quickly correlate presented concepts with their practical implementation. As is common, our computer graphics lectures are supported by a series of practical exercises in a lab. We have five labs devoted to rasterization, two to ray tracing, and one for assignment related topics. We had a lot of ground to cover for the two ray tracing labs. Here is how we structured them using Rayground. Lab 1 had an introductory one hour session where we familiarize students with the Rayground interface, explain the programmable pipeline and the scene definition format. We would then set up a simple orthographic camera and introduce the basic object properties provided by the Rayground API. We then introduce image synthesis using ray tracing. A perspective camera is set up. Direct lighting from point light sources with visibility queries is added. Then, a basic global illumination algorithm is implemented using the Lambert BRDF and next event estimation. Finally, post-processing is discussed. The second lab covers even more advanced topics. The Cornell box from the first lab is extended with area lights, soft shadows, sampling and anti-aliasing. Finally, we set up a witted style ray tracing demo scene where we implement procedural textures glossy reflections and refraction. We emphasize on the fact that all these effects are very hard to implement in rasterization and how ray tracing allows us to generate these pretty pictures in an elegant manner. When designing the graduate course, our main concern was with the fact that we wanted to incorporate a wide range of topics and accommodate varying students' background. In terms of ray tracing alone, we also had to cover a lot of ground, including basic ray tracing concepts, light transport theory, and path-based sampling. These will have to be combined together with rasterization, visualization tools and techniques, virtual reality technologies, graphics applications, etc. Rayground helped us even more when designing the graduate lab course. We devoted four two-hour labs to ray tracing. The first two labs covered the same topics as the undergraduate labs in order to get unacquainted students up to speed. Lab 3 continues with more advanced topics like visibility determination, ambient occlusion, physically based BRDFs and important sampling of BRDFs. Finally, the fourth lab introduces multiple important sampling, path-based sampling, scattering events, phase functions, and volumetric light transport. The introduction of Rayground was an exciting and productive experience for both instructors and students. Most students quickly caught up with the API and the mechanics which they found very intuitive, both as an interactive platform 
and a companion tool for lectures, it helped them understand fundamental concepts better and inspired them to experiment further with ray tracing. A lot of them were instantly drawn to ray tracing's elegance and potential for realistic image synthesis compared to rasterization. Ray ground cannot yet accommodate certain fundamental computer graphics concepts, mainly due to the current status of web-based graphics technology. Two of our major concerns include animation systems and bidirectional methods, which are instrumental to image synthesis. We are also looking forward to a broader case study and the continuous evolution of courses based on Rayground over the coming years. As a closing note, we believe that Rayground can be more than an educational tool. It can serve as a community hub for ray tracing related subjects where people share, develop and publish ideas. The high availability of the web makes it a suitable place to present best practices and propose new methods. Standard algorithms like BRDFs, light sampling, filters, denoisers and others can be made indexable and reproducible for everyone online. Thankfully, technology is also advancing, with WebGL support constantly improving and the new WebGPU specification for accelerated graphics and compute on the web on its way. We're working towards a major release very soon. Thank you very much. So we're back. Uh, thank you, Nick, for this uh, very interesting presentation. So I think we have uh, one question in Discord. So the question is from uh, Mario Romero. Uh, the role, what's the role of Rayground for distant education, for example, now? Uh, what's your comment on that? Yes, hi. I uh, hope you can hear me. Um, uh, we have already used uh, Rayground for distant teaching. It's, uh, it's a perfect tool for, uh, for having uh, students work together with the instructor who shares his screen and shows, uh, and shows uh, graphics related topics. And it is very easy for students to set up their own environment in their web browser and uh, use Rayground. So we used it uh, in uh, two occasions this semester and it worked out uh, very well. It really helped us in this regard. So I think we have a follow-up uh, from Mario again. Sometimes the students do not have access to graphics workstation. Can students use laptops or just their phones? Well, especially for phones, um, because they are very low power devices, uh, Rayground uh, can run on phones but uh, the editing experience is not that good. Uh, it's very difficult to edit shader code under the phone, but uh, you can always preview uh, results from the, submitted, uh, from the submitted projects. And as for laptops, Rayground works, uh, works very well on laptops because it uses the WebGL standard. So any medium to high-end laptop, can run Rayground examples easily, so it can be very useful. Okay, so let's move to the YouTube chat. Uh, can you please highlight how it can it was received by the students during I don't know this semester? Yes, the first thing the students liked uh, was the interactivity. Uh, the fact that they just pressed uh, a URL and we were able to preview ray tracing uh, going live it was amazing for them. They didn't have to set up uh, any specific IDE or download any libraries. Everything worked out of the box. 
and uh, they also like the GL like uh, API. We from the beginning we wanted to offer something like that. I mean, I mean, OpenGL has GL underscore something. Rayground has RG underscore something, and it it made it very easy for them to do the mapping from ray tracing uh, fundamentals to the appropriate uh, built-in variable in Rayground. So instantly they liked the experience and they were able to start doing ray tracing uh, uh, things right away. Okay, I think the last the last question is from uh, Maria Beatriz Suja Sandos. It's a very generic question. How is it possible to use the project? Okay. Rayground uh, is online, free, and available for everyone. You can uh, go online and register, and register, and you can have a series of private projects and public projects. So an instructor can very easily uh, go online, register, it's free, as I said, and uh, create the project for his course. And uh, and later make them public for for the students to work on them or create some presentation projects it's very simple and uh, registration as i said is free there's a, everyone can use the tool it's very uh, that's a very important thing from the beginning okay thank you nick so thank you Uh, to the next presentation. Uh, the presentation is uh, entitled by Designing a Course on Non-Photorealistic Rendering. Uh, the presenter is Ivailo Ilinki from uh, Gettingburg College, USA. And uh, let's move to the action. This talk will share experience with teaching a course on non-photorealistic rendering. We will discuss the design of the course, describe the projects that represent the main topics, and conclude with some thoughts for the future. Now, The highlight of a typical computer graphics course is often the ray tracing project that models light material interactions and produces realistic looking images as shown in the image on the left. On the other hand, uh, one could try to model the interactions of artistic media and try to capture the salient characteristics of artistic styles so that the resulting image appears to be a reproduction of an artist's work as shown in the image on the right. Early work in NPR includes systems for pen and ink illustrations, uh, hatching techniques to capture the 3D structure of an object, algorithms for painterly rendering and animation, and grafto techniques that add expressive detail to simple objects. To create these artistic effects, researchers have proposed ways to model, for example, the diffusion of watercolor paint on paper, or used observations from electron microscope uh, to model paper and pencil interactions. This is not an attempt to provide an exhaustive list of NPR work, but just to give a sense of the range of creative ideas. Our course ran as a typical semester-long course with two meetings of 75 minutes per week. Ten students were enrolled in the course, and they were undergraduate, junior, and senior computer science majors. The students completed nine projects during the semester, each taking between a week and a week and a half. This was an upper-level elective whose prerequisites are the equivalent of CS1 and CS2, though in our case these are stretched to three semesters. The course used Python and two of its libraries for numeric computation and image manipulation. The goal of the course was to introduce the students to an area of computer graphics that is rarely covered as a single unit. And the second goal was to expose them to published research and to develop their skills of reading and implementing published algorithms. The course design was similar to flipped classroom style and was organized around weekly readings of papers. Students were paired randomly in readings groups, with partners changing each week, and one pair led the classroom discussion. On the second day, the course instructor filled in some of the details or provided additional background and explanation. At times, the project or paper required more than one week to go over all of the details. 
before the class discussion, each pair was expected to send an email to the course instructor with questions and observations, ideas for implementation, and when possible with suggestions for connections to previous projects. The paper selection was somewhat arbitrary and was based on review of the proceedings of the symposium on NPR. If a paper added a new topic and a quick read suggested that it might be feasible to implement within a week or two, it was included in the list. The final selection had papers on a variety of NPR styles and techniques, and we'll discuss each of these by presenting the corresponding projects. The first project served as an introduction to Python and its support libraries. It also served as an introduction to image processing by asking the students to implement basic algorithms for convolution, creating a predefined filter, computing gradient information, and so on, as shown in the images below. The MATLAB equivalents of the expected functionality are listed on the right. The first NPR project was on halftoning, where the goal is to convey the content of a grayscale image using elements, uh, typically dots, of varying densities and sizes. The main algorithm is elegantly simple. The image is split into two regions of equal density, and the process repeats recursively on each subregion until a predefined depth. The final regions can be rendered in different styles to achieve different effect. For example, one can just draw the center of the region, draw its full outline or draw only two adjacent edges, or draw opposite edges by connecting them to the neighboring regions. Of particular interest is the last style, which connects the centers of the regions by running traveling salesman optimization. For our students, TSP is usually only of theoretical interest, so it is nice to see a creative application. The TSP optimization was carried out by an external program. The students only had to save the points in the required format and then read the result. The second MPI project introduced the concepts of edge detection and line drawing. The algorithm works by computing the gradient and its tangent flow. Next, it refines the tangent flow by orienting weak directions to follow their dominant neighbors. Finally, it identifies the edges by following streamlines along the tangent flow and applying Gaussian filters in a narrow band to take into account neighboring streamlines. The main step of the algorithm is an iterative refinement of the tangent flow. Specifically, during tangent flow refinement, each tangent direction, shown here in red, is replaced by a weighted sum of its neighbors. One of the weights is the dot product, which is stronger when the direction is closely aligned with its neighbor. The other weight is designed to give stronger influence to neighbors that have higher gradients. The next step identifies edges by following streamlines along the tangent flow. To get stronger indication about the presence of an edge, it also considers neighboring streamlines by applying a difference of Gaussians in a narrow band perpendicular to the current streamline. Here is a sampling of final results. We were not as successful with completing the algorithm as evidenced by the weak edges drawn in the images. Nevertheless, some of the ideas and functionality, such as streamline following, could be used directly in subsequent projects. The next project was on generating mosaics by tracing curves in an image with particles guided by the tangent flow or by a process inspired by the influence of a magnetic field on an electric charge. The algorithm first computes the edge tangent flow using the method from project 3. The next step is to generate initial placement for particles, and the paper suggests using a half-toning algorithm. Fortunately, we had implemented one in project 2, and it was good to see that the students had read the paper carefully and had identified these connections before the discussion meeting. Next, two curves are traced from each particle starting in opposite directions. The motion is described by the standard formulas with velocity and acceleration, and the paper suggests two options for computing the driving force. Either use the pre-computed tension flow from project 3, or consider the particle as an electric charge moving in a magnetic field perpendicular to the plane. Tracing a curve stops when it reaches the boundary, or another curve. This gives a set of regions that are then filled by the average color of the corresponding region. Here is a visualization of the process using the Lorentz force to guide the motion. And here are some results based on a lotus flower image. The image on the right relies on the tangent flow from project 3, which affects the results here as well.
Project 5 applied ideas from computational geometry, namely the Voronoi diagram, to produce half toning or stippling effect. We adapted the idea to produce a different type of mosaic, a tiling with regular grid cells. The algorithm starts by generating a set of points. It then repeatedly computes the Voronoi diagram of the points and then replaces them with the centroids of the Voronoi cells. At the end of this cycle, the Voronoi diagram converges to a centroidal Voronoi diagram, which simply means that the Voronoi sites coincide with the centroids of the cells. The centroidal Voronoi diagram has the nice property that as the number of points increases, the cells tend to converge to regular hexagons. Similar to project 2, the computation of the Voronoi diagram was done by an external program. The students only had to save the points in the required format and then read the result. At the end, each Voronoi cell is filled with its average color, which together with the regular shape of the cells creates a nice mosaic or tiling effect. Here is a visualization of the process. Starting with a random set of points and using the pixel intensities as the measure for density, the algorithm moves the points to produce a centroidal Voronoi diagram. Computing the centroids requires efficient computation of total density per region and the moments about the x and y axes. We illustrate how the density per region can be computed efficiently using a sweep line. If one pre-computes partial sums of densities along each row, then as the sweep line moves, the total density per segment within a region can be computed via a single subtraction of the partial sums at the edge intersections. Since the Voronoi diagram was computed externally, the main task for the students was to implement the sweep line algorithm and to compute each region's density and its centroid. This project introduced the students to ideas from computational geometry, namely the Voronoi diagram and sweep line processing, and these are topics that are not typically present in our curriculum. Here is a visualization of the tiling process. And here is a comparison between the first and last Voronoi diagram. Here are a few more results. Project 6 introduced a technique for processing an image to produce an impressionist effect. Many of the pieces required for this project were already completed in previous assignments. The algorithm starts by computing the gradient and then generates stroke centers on a regular grid. To avoid rendering artifacts, the centers are processed in random order. For each center, we extend the stroke in opposite directions by following tangent to the gradient, similar to the process in projects 3 and 4. The stroke stops after a predefined distance or when an edge is detected. Here is a visualization of the process. And here are a few more results. The next project was an example of modeling the interaction between light and the paint deposited by the strokes. The final result gives a 3D embossed effect, or impasto style. This was a natural continuation of project 6 since the algorithm is designed to work as a post-processing step to any stroke-based algorithm. It also made it possible to introduce the students to illumination models and bump mapping since the idea in project 7 is to produce a height field by composing the strokes and then effectively render the surface defined by the height field. The algorithm receives as input the collection of strokes. It then simulates the rendering process by composing the strokes over the image, and for each pixel, keeping track of a measure of the accumulated height. The quad surface defined by the height field is used to derive a normal vector at each pixel, and this is then rendered with a standard illumination model and bump mapping, which gives the 3D appearance. This slide illustrates the process of UV mapping each stroke onto a height map texture created by the paper author. As the strokes are composited, the surface defined by the overall height field is used to compute the per pixel normals. The renderer with the illumination model and bump mapping was given to the students, so they only had to compute the height field and the per pixel normals as input to the renderer. Here is an example of student work for various height fields given by the author. When the final height field is given, the students only compute the per pixel normals. And here are examples from the images produced in project 6, with the strokes used as input to the current algorithm. 
In this case, both the image height field and per pixel normals are computed. The final NPR project introduced the students to pixel art. The goal here is to convey an accurate impression of the original image with reduced resolution and limited color palette size. This project took two weeks to complete since it required reading and implementation of additional papers on superpixels and deterministic annealing for clustering and optimization. Some discussion about the implementation is given in the paper. Here is an example of student work. Note that in the slides the images have been scaled to be the same size, but the actual dimensions and number of available colors are significantly reduced. Finally, we briefly mention another project which was of separate interest and included in the course, although it would not be categorized as non-photorealistic rendering. This project introduced the idea of image in painting, that is, manipulating images to remove defects or perhaps remove an object from the image. The implementation was based on the paper by Chen and Shen, but we also discussed the paper by Bertomio and colleagues, and the test images come from the Bertomio paper. Here are examples of student work. The text in the top image and the scratches in the bottom image have been removed, and the algorithm has filled in successfully the missing pixels to preserve local structure. Here is an example of a more difficult restoration, where the goal is to remove the defects represented by the red regions. The algorithm takes longer to converge, and the final result still has visible defects. We would have liked to include a project on ASCII art, and in particular on the structure-based ASCII art generation. Unfortunately, the papers that we reviewed seem to require fairly significant effort in terms of implementation, but we welcome suggestions for possible projects. One possibility is the work presented at Eurographics in 2017. Although it differs somewhat from our goal, it might be a candidate for an NPR course in general. In conclusion, the student feedback suggested that the course met its original goals. The students reported confidence in reading and understanding published research. They also expressed satisfaction with the results from their work and shared that the final images were certainly worth the invested effort. The students also stated that the course had improved their programming and debugging skills. It was also good to confirm that the projects were feasible to implement, most requiring approximately 250 lines. My initial selection was based on the impression that the work can be completed, but given that this was the first offering of the course, there was always uncertainty about what exactly was possible. It should be noted that we did not aim to implement every idea in every paper. We selected portions that captured the main idea and were self-contained. For example, the Impressionist paper includes discussion on processing videos while maintaining temporal coherence. This was not included in our discussions. In terms of advice on teaching a similar course, here are a couple of things to consider. First is the choice of language. Python's flexibility made it a good choice for us, but MATLAB and possibly even C++ might work okay. It is important to be prepared and to provide pre-computed data when possible. This is both to speed up development, but also to help students who could not complete a previous project. For example, the edge tangent flow from project 3 takes a bit of time to compute, and also it could be difficult to get right in the short time frame, so pre-computed results help. The half-flipped classroom design encourages students to put effort into understanding the algorithms, so if feasible based on class size, it would be good to incorporate. Things that need to be revisited for a future offering include offering more structure on the assignments. My initial expectation was that the students will come up with their own design and implementation, but the limited time frame makes it difficult to both read and understand the paper and also come up with adequate design. Better ideas are needed for standardizing testing and parameter specification to remove the burden both on the instructor during grading and also on the students during development. It would also be good to explore options for visualization that can aid during the development process. The results presented in this talk are based on the work of Tracy Tang and Shunan Yu. So we are back. So thanks, uh, Vilo, for this very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I, I think it's very tough to design a unique course on non-photorealistic rendering. 
uh, on scratch from scratch and uh, so uh, let's check uh, we have I think we have one question in discord so the question is from Gita Domic what kind of students do you have surely uh, computer science Yes, so uh, the course is intended for the computer science students. Can you hear me? Yeah, so it is intended for computer science students. Uh, it just so happened that a number of them were uh, math minors or one was a math major. So at least uh, maybe half of the students happened to have taken linear algebra and uh, uh, multivariable calculus. Uh, but it is intended for a general uh, CS uh, uh, student and um, having the math background certainly helps. Uh, I think it's possible to uh, to conduct the course without uh, the math background. Okay, so I have one question. So uh, I don't remember if you mentioned it in your presentation, but uh, I have written the, the paper. So uh, non photorealistic is, I think, is not photorealistic animation and rendering. So from what I read is that animation was outside the scope of his work. Am I right? Yes, that's uh, that's correct. Uh, animation. I did not spend much time looking at it. Uh, I assumed that it would be difficult to fit in the course. Uh, and so that was kind of after I identified all the other topics that I wanted to include. Uh, there was no space for the animation, but I suspect it might take a little bit uh, uh, of time to, to set up. Uh, I would welcome ideas, though, if some if someone knows of um, uh, reasonable, uh, simple to implement and convey the idea applications with animation. Uh, I would certainly would be interested to hear those. So yeah, so uh, I just couldn't find them. So you have plans for extending this work with uh, animation and stuff. If I could find something, yeah, if, if uh, uh, there are suggestions for something that's feasible, uh, for example, the project on uh, image in painting could be replaced with uh, either the uh, ASCII art or animation. Uh, I'm just looking for something that's, uh, that's manageable and feasible. So any ideas would be welcome. So we have another question. Uh, I can join, I can merge this question with the question I also have. So David Kudak asks, uh, do you have some students' feedback uh, about the difficulty of implementing all this stuff? And uh, my uh, question is, if you observe any difference between students, uh, especially those that uh, have experience in computer graphics and those that do not have? So actually, uh, none of the students had taken computer graphics. So for them, uh, this was uh, uh, at least the subject was uh, new. Um, in terms of uh, difficulty, um, so the projects are actually, uh, once you put it together, as I said, they are about 200 lines, 250, some a little bit shorter, some maybe a little bit uh, longer. But it's, uh, I guess, the debugging that uh, takes uh, takes a bit of time. And uh, uh, yeah, we, we, we have office hours, so they uh, they would come maybe daily. I have office hours for two hours every day, so students would come. Uh, and sometimes the bug would be a simple bug, but it sets you back maybe for an hour. Uh, it could be even as simple as uh, integer division that you didn't realize. Um, so uh, it was certainly, uh, just like any graphics course, I get the same feedback uh, in computer graphics as in this course. Uh, uh, print, printing values uh, is not very helpful for debugging. Uh, you just get a bunch of numbers. So you really have to be careful and patient. And some people are patient and some are less so. Um, but yes, we. Uh, Fortunately, the students uh, put in the work, and with uh, with uh, my availability and uh, email questions, uh, we will manage to uh, uh, to move through. And I, I don't think uh, it was impossible. I think it was just uh, just right. Uh, and, and now that I've done it, uh, there are things that I can look for and uh, guide them along and uh, 
kind of anticipate some of the trickier portions so that I can warn them ahead of time. Thank you, thank you, Vilo. Uh, that was very interesting. So now we can move to the to the last presentation. Uh, critical thinking ship for design thinking in programming course. Uh, uh, it's from Jonathan Roberts and Panos Ritsos from Bancorp University, UK. And uh, let's move to the video presentation. In programming courses. I'm Jonathan Roberts and I'm going to beg. Welcome to our presentation on critical thinking sheets for design thinking in programming courses. I'm Jonathan Roberts and I'm going to give you this presentation. This is work by myself and Panos Ritsos from Bangor University. When we're presenting and working with students, it's not easy to get the students to think about the programming and the, and the aspects of coding that they need to do. And they often just rush into creating code. They type away and actually with a little bit of thought and careful consideration before their coding, they might uh, create a better process and a better result. In this work, we present a quick design process, which does encourage learners to sketch their designs and reflect on their work before they implement it. We ask our students to do different tasks. These tasks help them learn computing, uh, computer science and different programming languages. In computer graphics, we may ask them to develop a user interface. Maybe we get them to create uh, and build a calculator or develop a computer game. Maybe we get them to make a drawing application or make a renderer, something that will help them learn something aspect of computer graphics. But not all these questions are the same. Some of these questions are open-ended. Build a tool. Develop a computer game. It's much more open-ended and others are closed. Create a circle, a red circle or a blue square. And maybe others are a bit of both. Implement an algorithm that like we did in a lecture. We haven't given them the code to do that algorithm. They have to work that algorithm code out and to create the answer themselves. We can think about this in terms of Bloom's taxonomy. The activities such as remember and understand can be addressed by closed questions, whereas analyze, synthesize, and evaluate at the top can be addressed by more open ended questions. Okay, now let's think through what a student would have to do to answer these activities. So some of the questions the students would need to do a little bit of planning and critical thinking. If they were asked to implement an algorithm such as line drawing algorithm, they probably need to think how they're going to move along the x axis and calculate the y, y equals mx plus c, and how they were going to plot the points. There's definitely some thought there that they have to think about. And there's some graphics that they need to plot. On the other hand, if they're thinking about much more open-ended questions, like develop a game, like a maze game, and maybe wandering around a maze where a virtual character is being controlled by the, by the user to solve the maze, we have to think about what type of maze, how are you going to move? Are we going to be in 3D or 2D? What are you going to see? How are we going to generate the maze? All these different questions need much more planning and forethought. So we got thinking in a class, how can we help the students to think more critically, to plan a, bit, a little bit better than just starting to code and just coding? How can we get them to think? Well, we have already a methodology that helps them to think through all their designs for the more open-ended questions. 
the five design sheets enables them to think through and sketch all these different different ideas, alternative ideas. So the five design sheets enable students to think through different ideas. On the first sheet, it's all about the ideas. It's all about coming up with novel ideas and different ways of solving that problem. So this works really good. If you have a game, you can think through all those different types of games, how you would interact with them and think through all those different ideas and you refine those ideas on that first sheet. On the second, third and fourth sheet, you can then think through three specific solutions in much more detail, thinking about how they look, how they in be interacted, what's the main point to those different ideas, etc., and have a discussion, positive and negatives. On the fifth sheet, this is going to be your realization sheet. This is going to be the design that you will then build. You will then put um, to, uh, to code and actually commit. So your final sheet, you can then think through the actual details that you're going to be using to implement it. Let's have a quick demonstration of that. Here we have a heritage application. The idea is to take lots of photographs of standing stones and heritage items and uh, generate three-dimensional models from that using an idea of photogrammetry. So we have an app that we can develop and the app would have different interfaces so we can go through those interfaces on the first sheet. And then in the middle sheets, we'd look at three specific solutions to that. And then the final sheet, we have the idea that we're going to be implementing it. So there's a little bit more detail on that sheet. Here's a student's example uh, on that very same thing. They're looking at a color application in computer graphics, and they've done an animation of different color models. Here in the first sheet, they've got all their different ideas, how they can look at the color models and the color map and different things. And the second, the third, and fourth sheet, they're looking at three specific ideas. And then the final sheet, that's their realization sheet. And so now we see their animation, their final animation. With her student example, I've left up their first sheet and their last sheet. You can see there's a journey that they're that they've gone on from lots of ideas to specific ideas to their implementation. And they're not always the same. The implementation is slightly different to perhaps some of the ideas that they had. That's fine. That's OK. Uh, it's a journey and they've learned. And there's purpose to those uh, five design sheets is they've learned through that process of drawing and sketching. If you want to know more about this model, this methodology, then we have written several papers and a book. Um, 2011 started off in actually this conference as well, the first five design sheet paper, and then got a transaction visualization paper and now a book. And there's a website as well if you want more information. The five design sheet methodology is a great methodology to look at open ended questions and get students to think through many different ideas. But it does take time. And the challenge is not in all in all labs, we don't have that long time to develop different ideas. Also, we want to focus on how to implement. So we wanted a method really to get students to consider a specific question asked of them, to get them to think critically about their interface and about their solution, and maybe what underpins that particular algorithm that they're trying to implement and help them to quickly decide on an implementation of something that they're going to build. And also get them to perhaps think of something visual, what they were going to build within their uh, graphics and their answer. We tried several methods. We started off with a blank sheet of paper. But before we go into that, let's talk a little bit about our scenario. So we have at the university, we give lectures. So these are uh, large sessions where we go through the algorithms and the concepts within computer graphics. And then afterwards, they have a lab session where they sit and they can go through a series of questions that uh, we've sent them. And they start off being quite simple, um, drawing a square, drawing a rectangle. Um, and then they go on to be becoming much more complex, drawing lines, uh, drawing complex uh, shapes and circles. Um, and then finally, they have a larger assignment. In our case, we get them to do uh, a pattern editor. 
with a blank sheet of paper. That's fine, but the students didn't really know what to do. Some of them doodled, <laughs> some of them wrote, um, wrote down some notes from the lab, some of them looked at uh, alternatives and did a bit of coding, put some code down, but it wasn't easy. Um, the students didn't really know what to do with it, how to start. Um, they get frightened quite often with a blank sheet of paper and didn't really know what to do. They were frightened about actually doing something wrong, so actually, in the end, didn't use it. So here's the critical thinking sheet. There are five parts to the sheet. First thing that students were all fill in is what is the challenge, a brief description of what they are asked to do. And then probably they will go to the sort of sketch area and start to sketch what they are trying to do. Maybe a grid or the output, some sort of interface maybe that they're developing. Then they need to think through the components. Quite often the, the uh, task can be split into several parts. Do this first and then this and then something else. Then they move on to thinking about what are the algorithmic steps. Maybe there's a key algorithm or a set of steps they have to follow. So for instance, in the line drawing algorithm, there's uh, an interpretation that they move in the X and calculate the Y. So this is sort of a whole set of steps that they would move on the for loop, calculate the value, round the value, and then plot the value. So there's a sort of set of steps that they can do in pseudocode within that. And then finally, they need to think, how can they turn what they have done into an implementation? So these are sort of five steps that they do. In our lab sessions, we get them to do this for every main task. So maybe they're drawing something like a grid. So they would sketch on the critical thinking sheet and work out what they're going to be doing. And then when they've done that, they'll move on to another sheet and another task and implement that as well. Then we can sort of see through some examples. So here's an example of a student. So the idea here is that they're creating uh, sort of a, a leaf pattern, an inverse leaf pattern. And you can see there's sort of three main components. There's the crosses, there's the sections down the center, and then there's the bottom left, and then the top right leaf patterns, which are created by lines. So they have to work out how to draw a line from a very high value to a very low value and increment each of those down to get the lines to get a curve. So they work out through that, they draw it, they think about the components, those three main parts. They think about also and the final part, they need to think about the implementation and they have to think about the end cases, how many squares they're going to put in. Uh, they'll need one less square than, than they probably got in the for loop. In another task, we get the students to do spirals. So they have to create a spiral out of a set of rectangles and then group that all together in one spiral and one group of spirals and then move and copy it to other places. So they have to work out how to do those spirals. And again, they can think about the components, how many components they need, how many. So they need a component, which is a rectangle and then a rotation, then group that together. And then they can look, look to see what it looks like and then the algorithm and then how to implement it. So they go through the same steps again. So now let's look at a few examples. In the first example, we see a student on the right hand side with their critical thinking sheet and they filled in the different individual parts. And on the left hand side, you see a static image of their work. In the next example, we see a student who's chosen to make it much more interactive um, and they can directly click on the individual parts and they will be highlighted. And we see their critical thinking sheet as well that they have done for that. In the final example, we see a student has chosen to have two tiles as displays as an interface on the left hand side. Um, you can uh, then alternate between A and A and B, etc., to get a tiled display on the right hand side. 
this way they're exploring different tessellations, different organizations of the tiles, and it's a good practice for different aspects of computer graphics. So does it seem to be working? Well, yes, in some ways, yes, it is. Students are using it, students are completing it, they are getting their, uh, their tasks done. So what do they say about it? Well, we, in our evaluation, one of the students said, this is the first critical sheet I created when I just started out on the project. I had an idea of how to create the tool, but actually it made quick design and noting down some initial ideas really helped me. By completing the sheet, I was able to see how the pattern could be repeated. If I'd started writing the code straight away, then it's likely that I'd forgotten about the push-pop matrix and I would have been wasting my time fixing errors. Another student says something like, the main benefit of using the critical sheet was to solve the pro problem to allow me to visually demonstrate where the tiles and squares needed to be, rather than guessing what offsets. So they are thinking, they're thinking through the sheets, they're using it as a way to understand what's going on. They're helping themselves to understand better before actually jumping into code. So this is a success. This is actually doing what it's supposed to do. But actually there are still challenges. Not all the students actually said that they liked it or were using it. A few actually said, well, I found them useful, but they weren't really for me. Another student sort of said, well, I actually struggle to get anything prepared first. I just jump into code. And then when I started to question that student, they started to say, well, actually, perhaps if they had thought a bit more deeply about the problem, about the issue, then maybe they wouldn't have spent so much time in debugging it. And it was interesting, one of their mates said to them, well, have you done your, have you done your critical thinking sheet? Have you thought about it before? And they said, no. They said, and they said, well, that's why you're getting so many errors, so many code errors. So I think it is working and uh, we need to be doing much more investigation to see how it is working and much more quantitative analysis of this. This is what we're doing at the moment. I want to finish with a, a student sandwich. <laughs> Let's start with successes. So I think it is working. I think it's something that students enjoy doing on the most, that they have been saying that it's been useful, uh, that they were thinking about the challenge and about the problem in a different way, and that it was really helping them to critically think about what they were going to do. The visual aspects of it was really useful, that they could think through and actually draw what they were going to do, they'll plan it out and actually put calculations and equations and values onto their uh, critical thinking sheet to help them really think about what they were doing. So I think it has been successful. I think it uh, we've been now using this for three years. It is something that we have been successfully using uh, throughout our the course and the computer graphics course. Challenges. <laughs> so not all students like it. Not all students want to use it. They don't see the worth in it. Um, they see that they worry that they um, might make the wrong answer. So they worry that they might, might put something on the sheet. They, some students create it after they've finished coding, they fulfill the task. So they post create it, which you can tell because it looks a bit too accurate <laughs> and a bit too uh, um, f finished and complete. Um, okay, so there are some challenges. But even sometimes when the students are saying that they don't like it, when they stop to think about the benefit of it, then they do actually realize what I'm trying to do. In a way, that's half of the problem and half the challenge. And actually, that's a success, although it's really a challenge as well for that student not to appreciate it in the beginning. They are realizing what we're trying to do. Finally, opportunities. I think within teaching, we have so many opportunities to do things differently, to think. I like this idea of thinking slowly, thinking carefully, thinking differently. And I think uh, in computer graphics, especially some of the concepts are not easy to understand. We have a challenge to ourselves as teachers to think differently and to critically think if 
of ways to help us teach the material better. And I think the critical thinking sheets is one way, one method. The five design sheets is another method. These are all methods to help us and help students develop and learn and apply themselves to the challenges that we set them. And I definitely think that the critical thinking sheet is one good tool in our tool belt that will help us think about or how the students think about their problems. And I think it's good at this time to get the students to think about what they were going to do, think critically about what they're doing, and think carefully of what they have done and reflect on what they've done. Well, thanks very much and uh, wish you all well. So thanks, Jonathan, for the presentation. Uh, very interesting stuff. Thank so you. let's move to the, the Q&A session. I think we have a, a question in Discord. Uh, in your experience, how many students can be accommodated per seed idea implementation? And how can the seeds be adapted for hybrid courses? So yeah, so we use them in our labs. Um, so we have a sort of hands-on session in the lab. We have myself and uh, a, a lab demonstrator. So there's two of us and we have about 50 within the, the that particular session, uh, 50 students. Um, the students sort of work on those sheets on the, in their own, in their own time. Uh, and we go around if they have any questions, we try to inspire them and say, well, have you thought about the challenge and the problem in this way? Uh, try and encourage them to 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 write something um, down on the, or, or to sketch something first. So yes, yeah, so I think it's, it's usable and doable within that situation because uh, the, the students are somewhat autonomous. Um, so I think, yes, it's definitely doable within that and, and expand to larger, larger um, class sizes. Um, the second part of the question was to do with uh, could it be used for other types of projects? Well, the students in in our experience also use these these uh, sheets uh, for projects on their own. Um, they uh, they they have to submit uh, a scanned version of their so they do an assignment on their own, which is done in their own time, and they do a sheet and submit the sheet and then submit their their work um, their their, uh, their their tool that they have built. Um, they also do uh, a report at the end, so they have a sort of three parts they have to submit. The report is like a reflection report where we also get them to reflect on their use of that critical thinking sheet. Um, so yes, I think definitely it can be used in, in projects, but it depends on the question that you're asking, I think. If, if you're asking the students to do a question which is much more quick and short and a bit more um, narrow, narrow question i guess then then critical thinking sheets work well i think if it's an open-ended design question build something build a game and that's your task then you need perhaps a different strategy something like the the five design sheets is if we're going to be work um, better in that situation so my question is is the cts part of the evaluation process uh the, yes, so we we don't give a mark, well, I don't allocate a mark for the critical thinking sheet themselves, but it, uh, well, it, sorry, I do give a mark to a critical thinking sheet, but it's quite low in comparison to the the uh, the, the whole, the, the, the tool that they're creating. Um, so it's, it's sort of 10% for that critical thinking sheet. Um, it's enough to encourage them to do it. Um, also, I want them to do it in a way you need to do it fast enough to get you going. Think first, do this sheet, get something down, and then go to, to do the implementation. It's, it's not to get all the answers done. It's not to get all the, all the uh, everything planned out. It's just to give you a start. So final question by me. Uh, so it's looked like that this is a, an ongoing project. 
that had started approximately 10 years ago, with a, again with an educational paper. So could you share us your thoughts on that journey and how have, has been grow during those years? Yeah, so um, it, as, I said, as I said, the five design sheets was presented here first in 2011 at this uh, workshop, uh, this conference. Um, so yes, we have gone on a bit of a journey. I think we have. There are different tools for different, different tools for different jobs, different purposes. Uh, so the five design sheets works really well for open-ended design questions, whereas the critical thinking sheet works well in a lab session, first and foremostly, um, allowing the students just to really critically think about what they're doing and quickly think. Um, I think um, it's. It's interesting, probably 10 years ago, it was the students have changed definitely over this journey. Um, they were much more reluctant uh, 10 years ago to sort of uh, to, to sketch, to, to, to think there was, there was coding. Whereas now, I think maybe it's maybe it's because we're using all these ideas within the university and there's a sort of an ethos around sort of, oh, yes, we do this, this type of thinking, we do this type of sketching. Um, but that's definitely changed. The students have definitely changed over that term. Uh, they're, they're much more accepting than they're, they, they're using. Um, the other thing is that I still feel very, very passionate about this idea of sketching and paper and using a pen and paper. Um, I think even with modern, modern technologies and, and uh, uh, iPads and smart tablets and all these things, uh, with pen devices, it's still hard to, to do some of this sketching. It's, it's moving that direction um, fast. Uh, it's making it much easier, but at the moment, I think pen and paper, everyone knows pen and paper, everyone knows how to do this, it's cheap, it's quite easy to do, it's quick to do, uh, it's throw away in a way. Um, and so yeah, oh, there are some experiences. So the final question is from YouTube. Has the method been used in other computer science-based uh, courses? Uh, so the critical thinking sheet, no. Um, the, that was really that was on our second year computer graphics course, and we've been used specifically for that. That's an algorithm. Really, it's predominantly teaching algorithms and teaching computer graphics algorithms in that course. Um, but the five design sheets, yes, we've used it across uh, across the whole. Uh, done the third year projects. Other people have taken it up. And it's not only me. It's, it's other other academics are, are using it. Um, could we have written graphics in the second year and user interface a web design course uh, yeah we used it have to be careful that we're not using it too much in a way <laughs> but, yeah cool. cool thanks jonathan thanks very much so, yeah that concludes our session thanks everyone for presenting watching and participating enjoy the rest of the virtual conference thank you